All right, guys, welcome back to another video. So today we're actually going to follow through with the second part of the portfolio review. So we already covered M1 Finance and Robinhood in part one on Saturday's video. So today we're actually going to follow up with the video about the individual brokerage account, individual retirement account, and a few of the other really small parts of the portfolio that generally kind of get overlooked. Um, we will keep real estate specifically for a separate video because I do have a lot of real estate investment trusts and I also have Fundrise and Cardone Capital as well. So I'll kind of leave that all for one video. So while there is real estate investment trusts with individual brokerage account and individual retirement account, we will cover those in a separate video. So uh, let's just hop right into this. We'll do the intro and then we'll dive deep into the fidelity aspect of things. So currently the portfolio is sitting about $416,000, uh, looking pretty good from that standpoint. Forward income, looking at just shy of $15,000 a year, uh, which is ending up to be close to $1,250 every single month, uh, which is looking pretty good. As you guys know, energy is probably the largest part of the portfolio in terms of value as well as income. Looking at these graphics on the top here, uh, followed by financials, real estate, looking at about 17, 18% for capital allocation and income respectively, and 14, almost 15% there and 15% uh, as well for real estate and income and capital allocation as well. Um, the rest of the sectors are generally speaking below 10%, uh, but have been evened out relatively well over the past six months to a year, just based off of the fact that energy used to be over 40% of the portfolio. And granted, yes, income is still a very large part of energy, obviously due to the exaggerated yields coming out of energy at the moment. But as you can see, capital allocation is below 20%, which I think is a first, and it's actually second now to financials and real estate is closing up uh, relatively close behind it in third, which is actually something I didn't recognize. But um, until just doing this video right now, uh, but that doesn't necessarily surprise me because I have been putting a lot of money into financials at the moment. I think Wells Fargo, J JP Morgan, BlackRock, if you can get it at the right price, as well as some other companies like US Bank or something that I've been putting my money into. Uh, I've been picking up those shares as I've seen the value. So not surprised that the capital allocation for financials has continued to climb uh, during this recent downturn. It's been getting hit relatively hard and I think it'll be okay in the long term, which is why I'm rather buying these shares while they're damaged in the short term and hopefully picking up great deals for the long term. So uh, actually looking specifically at the forecasted uh, dividends for the rest of the year, uh, specifically for all of everything. This is M1 Finance, Robinhood as well included. Uh, we're looking closer to the uh, 13,500 range. And so this does actually have uh, the Boeing shares removed. This does have some of the other companies that have removed dividends. So it also includes my Cardone Capital being paused for three months. Uh, and so the goal for 2020 is 14,000. So we're 550 or so dollars away from that. And I'm comfortable that with the additional capital contributions we'll have to the portfolio, as well as um, reinvested dividends, we'll be able to get close to that 14,000. But it will be hindered, uh, especially if other companies continue to uh, remove or suspend dividend payments in the short term. Uh, that being said, for 2021, I'm currently being optimistic, assuming that some of these companies continue uh, to resume their dividend payments if things kind of go back to normal. And I might adjust this in the future, uh, depending on what happens, because obviously we're just about getting to May. A lot of places are talking about reopening, and I understand uh, that will be uh, kind of getting to a new normal as we kind of enter summer time frame and we can kind of get a better idea as to what 2021 impacts might be. Of course, I believe there will be some, but um, currently looking at the 15,000 or so in 2021 uh, forward income there, just kind of like what we mentioned on the very first piece. So 
Uh, just giving you guys a quick look at Fidelity as a whole. Uh, this is where my individual brokerage account, individual retirement account are held. And so it's not the entire part of the portfolio. It's probably about 75 to 80% of the portfolio as a whole. Um, and you can see here uh, just the last two years, the consistent contributions uh, to the point where actually if you look at February 19th uh, of this year, which is really the peak of the market here, we had about 342000 925 in this uh, particular part of the portfolio and we're sitting at about 335 there's like one or two accounts for some reason that don't get counted um, between this graphic and and this graphic I don't necessarily know what it is but just looking here we're basically even uh, you could say it's about within one to two percent and that's obviously not due to the fact that the positions that I'm holding are even or anything like that it's the consistent capital contributions you're seeing in here uh, I have been getting unrealized capital gains throughout this entire two-year process but obviously we haven't doubled the portfolio value just over the past two years just off of uh, capital appreciation alone. So this does include a decent amount of capital contributions, about 40 to 50 percent of my income. So keep that in mind as well. Really trying to put that in here uh, so we can continue to grow the portfolio and get the dividend income, which is the reason for the portfolio as a whole anyway. But I just wanted to show this uh, figure for you guys so you guys recognize, one, how I'm actually adding capital to the portfolio, and two, some of you guys in the comments section mentioned, hey, we want to see you know, fidelity and, and what actually numbers look like and everything like that because I use the spreadsheets quite often. And... Um, People are like, you know, you can make up a spreadsheet. And I agree. And so that's why I like to show that every once in a while so people know uh, that there are some hard numbers behind there. And I generally just use the spreadsheet to keep things a little bit more organized and so you can see things in in sector allocation and, and what have you and so forth. So uh, just wanted to give a quick note for you guys, for the channel. Uh, three quarters of you guys watching today are not subscribed. So if you guys do like the videos and if Eric, this is your second or third time watching a video and you've got a lot of information and some things that you wrote down from the last two videos, feel free to hit that subscribe button so you can con continue to be like the one quarter of you guys that do subscribe and get notifications all the time. So um, fingers crossed and shout out to my girls. We're getting close to 6%, hoping to get that closer to 20% before the year is out, but we'll keep our fingers cross and continue to work uh, as we spread the message and spread the community love. So jumping back into the portfolio here, um, let's jump actually into the IRA first. So like I mentioned, we're going to not be looking at um, all the uh, portfolio values here today, uh, specifically M1 and Robinhood, because we already did that in the previous video, and we'll save uh, Cardone Capital, Fundrise, and all the real estate investment trusts for a separate video as well. So uh, this is the Roth IRA. It's not everything in here, but it's about a forty to $50,000 piece of the portfolio here. And actually what I want to do is have these kind of highlighted here um, and pull forward this particular column here, column L, so you guys can see if I'm up or down or sideways uh, on this particular position here. Um, so you can see that I have about seven or eight stocks in here. So I have BHP, Disney, First Solar, LYB, Maine, Philip Morris, uh, South 32, Virgin Galactic, and Verizon. Uh, and so some of these positions are up, some of these positions are down. And I think we're overall down, I believe. Let's just double check. And of course, this doesn't include the real estate. So uh, these numbers are a little skewed, but I'd say we're about two and a half to three percent down off these positions. I think the real estate aspect of things brings that up a little bit. So we're probably up overall in terms of the, the IRA here. But I would say one of the better ones that I've invested in is uh, BHP, best of this back in 2015 timeframe. So about 146 shares of this bad boy, up 86%. I'm going to hold this one forever. Um, going to be reinvesting dividends as well. So Disney up to 53 shares um, at a cost basis of about $103 a share here. Uh, First Solar bought it about $31 or so, up currently 31%. This is a long-term hold as well, which is why it's in the Roth IRA. We have OIB, which is probably the worst timing investment that I've had in here. Uh, and reason being is I just 
put money in in January, February timeframe and invested it all, um, basically all y LYB all the way up. And uh, what I maybe should have done is maybe invested over the course of a couple of weeks or something like that. So unfortunately, I got a pretty bad cost basis going into this. But 68 shares has a really good price to earnings ratio, I anticipate this material stock is going to be paying for quite some time. So going to reinvest the shares uh, or reinvest the dividends into this one rather, and hopefully continue to lower this cost basis over time. So obviously we have Main Street Capital is what I bought for my 2019 contributions into the Roth IRA. Currently sitting on a 35% loss or so. Uh, that's fine with me. I'm going to continue to get the capital from Main Street Capital and put it into other organizations as well. Uh, Philip Morris has continued to channel downwards over time. That's fine with me. It's a long-term hold. Uh, I just looked at the books again last week, and it looks like I'm going to continue to hold this one for a while, um, except, except for currency headwinds and stuff like that. The business for me is perfect. I think it's phenomenal. Um, you know, I really enjoy what they're trying to do with innovating IQOS. Um, if you're not familiar with that, check out the website. I think it's some pretty interesting stuff and has some potential growth potential in the future. It's actually been growing relatively well if you're interested in that. But of course, the traditional um, smoking division aspect of the business is continuing to slowly decline with time. Volumes are slowing to decline and same with revenues as well. So keep that in mind if you're going to invest in Philip Morris. South 32 is a small position where I got to touch on that. Virgin Galactic, I think, is a long term hold. It was kind of like a 1500, you know, uh, kind of spec stock said, you know, maybe it'll, it'll 10 X or maybe it'll 20 X over the time being, um, I think it could potentially be a, a $300 stock over the long term. So I said, you know what, it, it could be something that ends up being big, um, and could be worth about 75 billion, sorry, 170, $150 stock, not 300, um, could be worth about 75 billion, um, uh, in the future. And so I was like, you know what, uh, I'll take a piece of that. Worst case scenario, I lose the 1500 bucks. So not a big deal for me. And then, of course, you have Verizon, which I also have in my Roth or my individual brokerage account as well. So uh, we'll be seeing this one again in the future. And so that wraps it up really for the Roth IRA. Let's just kind of jump over to computer shares quickly. This is another place where I have um, some cigarette companies. But like I said, there are some real estate investments in here. So um, we'll talk about those more uh, on part three of this video. But we have Altria Group, we have Essential Utilities, Exxon, IBM, Keurig, Dr. Pepper, Philip Morris, Clorox, and Waste Management. So you have some um, some over 100% returns here and Essential uh, Utilities, which used to be Aqua America, used to be over 100% as well, except for the recent volatility that we're seeing in the market. Um, so really, this is um, actually a down portfolio based off of my big investment here in Exxon. You can see sitting at about a 30% loss uh, at the moment. But we're currently sitting about 200 shares of Exxon at the moment, 30% down at a cost basis of about $64. So um, going to continue to reinvest these dividends here, hopefully continue to bring down the cost basis. You can see we have about seven or eight shares of reinvested dividends already. Uh, that'll kind of be exaggerated as we continue to reinvest at these lower prices here. Uh, but uh, hopefully things continue to increase. I might add another tranche depending on if uh, it really stays down in these lower prices here. So hopefully get this to below $60 uh, per share uh, over the long term. We also have Altria Group, which is something I purchased back all the way in like 2015 timeframe. Um, and I've really just been holding on to it for quite some time. Relatively small position, uh, only down about 10%. Essential Utilities is the same. Started buying, you know, monthly, uh, 40 bucks here, 40 bucks there, um, for a couple of months until a point where I got about 23 shares or so. And I've just been reinvesting the dividends ever since, and uh, ended up with about 100% gain. Uh, really wish I never stopped on this one, to be honest with you. Uh, same with Keurig Dr. Pepper. This is actually the remainder. I own Dr. Pepper, had about $700, $800 worth of Dr. Pepper. And when they did the merger with Keurig, uh, they paid me out and gave me a $750 check. So um, just that alone, currently sitting on a 26% gain. 
plus I've already gotten, you know, a decent amount of my investment back um, just based off of the uh, the investment there in, there in Dr. Pepper. So uh, really wish I had all $800 or whatever it was uh, still in the stock, but unfortunately they cashed me out. Um, there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So Philip Morris again, uh, another 22 shares up about four, four and a half percent. Uh, nothing too really big there. Clorox and Waste Management also pretty small positions here, but both over 100%. Um, a lot of these computer shares accounts were something where I'd throw $50 a month, basically commission free. And obviously commission free isn't um, a big deal now, but it was back in 2014, 2015, when I was paying $7.95 to, to $5 every time I was buying and selling some of these transactions. So what I was doing is throwing 40, 50 bucks every couple months into some of these companies. And um, yeah, I accumulated some smaller positions here. And uh, once Fidelity started making things cheaper, um, you know, I was, I was just using Fidelity. Uh, and plus the user interface on Fidelity is a little bit better than computer shares. And by a little, I mean a good bit. So um, it really stopped uh, being really a, a big thing where I was really focusing a lot of my time in um, just based off of that fact as well. So then the YouTube Moolah account, this is all the money that I'm making from YouTube. I reinvest that back into the, to the portfolio for you guys to kind of see. So we're actually up on this part of the portfolio, uh, relatively small account here. Uh, you can see we're only up about 50 bucks, but it's around 35 to $4,000 at the moment. And we're currently adding about 200 to $300 every single month. Thanks to you guys continuing to support the channel. And so, uh, generally, when I first started this off, I was utilizing um, my uh, my investments into strictly ETFs. And I was going to kind of utilize it, but a lot of people weren't really enjoying those videos. So what I used then I started to do was um, actually. Uh, allow people to kind of choose what positions I was investing in. And so the first couple of positions that people asked me to do was uh, 3M, Johnson & Johnson. And I actually recently added Amazon into this, so I'll have to add it in. But it's like a, I think it's like 0.35 shares or 0.4 shares of Amazon. So it's a relatively small position. I think it's like um, 400, 500 bucks. It's not a lot. So I'll make sure to add that in here as well, because uh, that's actually currently missing. But um, but yeah, continuing to hopefully grow this account. And uh, if you guys have any suggestions as to what you want me to invest in, uh, leave it down in the comment section down below. I'm always taking ideas uh, for the future and uh, should be getting another couple bucks here pretty soon, I think. So um, every month now on the 20th or so, I think I get my check uh, if it's over $100, which over the past couple months it has been. So if you guys have any ideas, leave it down in the comments section down below. And let's move on to the big boy. The uh, Actually, we'll get the personal savings out of the way just because we can. Personal savings, I think, at the moment is uh, is about 7 or 8% of the... Um, dividend investing part of the portfolio. If you remove the um, if you remove the 401k aspect of things from the portfolio, currently sitting at about twenty thousand dollars cash. There are some smaller accounts like my checking and stuff that I don't incorporate into this value. Uh, they actually recently lowered the dividend yield down to one point five or the interest rather uh, APR down to 1.5. It was up at 1.7. So I was surprised actually. I was anticipating they'd probably lower it to like 0.9 or 0.25, which when I first started investing with personal savings, um, Amex rather, uh, it was at 0.25 and it actually climbed back up. So uh, relatively interesting, but still $300 from interest, obviously, um, due to this 20 grand kind of sitting in here. And this is kind of where I park the money when I'm currently either trying to save up for an emergency fund or just don't necessarily know what to invest in at the moment. What I generally do will be I move it to my checking account and then I'll put it into the Fidelity account where I generally make the purchases. So uh, after it gets to a couple months worth of expenses, um, I'll generally have like three to six months of expenses in here, not 
uh, income but expenses and uh, then I'll invest any sort of excess. So generally try to keep about 15,000 or more in here. Um, that's generally been the norm, uh, but it's gotten up to 40,000 in the past, um, just based off of like last year or two years ago when I was potentially looking at or starting to invest in physical real estate. So uh, we'll probably touch a little bit more on that in part three of this video. Um, so now let's actually look at the big boy, the individual brokerage account, uh, which houses about 150 or so thousand uh, of the money. But of course, there are some real estate investment trusts in here that won't be shown and we'll talk about them in the next video. But just going right down the list and we'll kind of go one by one. We have AbbVie, um, we have Boeing, BlackRock, Bryn Mawr Bank Trust, Bank of Nova Scotia, BP, BP Midstream Partners, Caterpillar. Chesapeake, CQP, Google, Johnson & Johnson, JP Morgan, Kinder Morgan, um, Cosmos Energy, Main Street Capital, 3M, Altria Group again, Pepsi, Philip 66, Royal Dutch Shell, uh, Cedro Partners, which uh, is no longer listed. Uh, you have AT&T, you have U.S. Bank, Visa, Verizon, and Wells Fargo. Now, of course, there are two or three real estate investment trusts that aren't in here either, um, so we'll cover those tomorrow. But, um, yeah, just overall looking at that, um, you know, just kind of going roughly down the line to see where we're at. We're down about 10000 so uh, eight and a, eight or so percent um, from the all-time, I guess, invested value here. Uh, Stag Industrial and Realty Income Corp, which we'll talk a little bit about more tomorrow, would help lower that as well. Um, you know, maybe a little bit less than 8%, but I'm happy with 8% down overall, just based off the fact that the all-time highs where we were, um, we are currently down, I think, 13 to 15 percent as of uh, as of Friday of last week. So uh, I'm fine sitting at that sort of loss, and I'm continuing to invest throughout the cycle, which I think is the reason why, in this particular part of the portfolio, I'm only down 8 percent instead of that 15 percent. And a lot of these positions have been bought, you know, over the past two, three years, you know, and I've been adding to them every couple months or so whenever I think the value in those positions is good. Uh, so something like Johnson & Johnson, you can see I'm sitting on $1,800 or 19, 20% gain. Um, but I didn't add, add to any Johnson & Johnson over the past month or so. Uh, it's actually been a couple, probably about a year or so maybe since I've invested in Johnson & Johnson in this part of the portfolio. Um, can't say that for M1 Finance or something uh, or other parts of the portfolio where I have invested in Johnson & Johnson. But same with Pepsi as well. Uh, bought Pepsi in the 90s. I don't think Pepsi's hit the 90s in this downturn. So uh, I'm currently sitting on a 40 or so percent gain on Pepsi um, and haven't bought any more. So um, probably will buy some more if it dips down below 110, which I don't think it has. But if it does, uh, in the near term future, I will be sure to purchase. Actually, it did hit 101, so I should have bought when it hit 101. Um, had I known that and had more cash, I probably would have. Um, but okay, jumping up top. So currently sitting on a gain for AbbVie, have about 117 shares at a cost basis, about 72. Uh, Boeing sitting about uh, 27 shares at a cost basis of 133. This is going to be a hold for a long time. I've wanted to own Boeing for a while. Haven't had an opportunity to buy at the right price. So um, granted, there is some turmoil going on and some uncertainty. And currently we're sitting on a loss at the moment on Boeing. But if it continues to go down to the 110, 100 range, I'll probably add a couple shares every other day or so just to kind of get the cost basis down just a little bit more. If I could get it down to the 100, 110 range, I would be ecstatic uh, and having about a 50 share position in that. We have BlackRock added two shares of this relatively recently, hoping I can get this cost basis below $400 a share. Um, currently sitting on a nice jump here. Uh, Bryn Mawr Bank Trust sitting at about a 20% loss. Recently added another 50 shares. Really want to um, get a lot of um, investment into this one. I think this is my largest ownership in any company that I have. Um, and uh, it's a local bank back home, so it would be cool to kind of own my local bank um, and have a pretty decent position in that. Uh, bank of Nova Scotia, I have 142 shares added relatively recently, uh, 30 so shares, uh, but I don't remember exactly at what price. Added 100 shares of BP at 25, currently sitting about 23, so we're sitting about 33% down 
on this one. BPMP currently sitting about 20% down on this one as well. Caterpillar actually sitting on a gain. Um, purchased two tranches of this one. Um, one, uh, actually three tranches rather. Uh, my initial position was back in October at 119 a share and continuing to uh, lower the cost basis. I believe one was at like 102 or 103 and another one was at 96. So continuing to lower the cost basis. If I get this below 100, man, I would, that would be, I'd be ecstatic. Um, Chesapeake, I might have to touch up on this one a little bit. I had a reverse split, so um, this should actually read as a loss uh, rather than a gain. So it actually shows up as a pretty big gain. So might actually uh, wipe out uh, a decent amount of, of gains here uh, just based off of that. But um, have to fix that Chesapeake energy position here. Uh, CQP is LNG. Um, it's basically just the partnership of LNG pays distributions. Uh, actually, surprised that we're only down 6% on this. Uh, really have been reinvesting the dividends a decent bit on this one, um, and we'll probably continue to do so in the future. Uh, we have five shares of Google here. If it continues to stay um, below $1,100 or so, I'll probably add one or two every single month. Uh, but we kind of are back above the $1,200 range, so I will not be adding to that. Uh, and same with Johnson & Johnson. If this bad boy goes back to the 120s, uh, 110 range, I'll be sure to add. And if that means I'm not going to be adding anytime soon, that's fine. I'm going to be reinvesting the dividends to get that um, continue to build that position over time. Uh, recently added to the JP Morgan position, 50 shares at a cost basis of about $90. Uh, I'll probably continue to add if this go, continues to stay below 90, uh, probably 10 shares or so every couple days. Uh, if it stays above 90, I'm really hoping to get some shares down in the 76 range, which was the 52 week low. Uh, but I don't know if we'll see that anytime soon unless we have some more turmoil in the market. Sitting on a pretty big loss in Kinder Morgan here. Uh, actually purchased this back in the KMP days, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, just going to hold this one for the long term as a pipelines business. Uh, I think it'll come around in the long term, but um, using it for the dividends at the moment, not really minding that 50% loss. It's been rather stagnant at that point. Um, you have Cosmos Energy here. Um, current cost base is around $3.41. I think this is a long-term hold. Spec play, uh, worst case, I lose $3,400. Not a big deal there. Um, does pay a dividend, but I think they're suspending the dividends, uh, I believe. So in the future, uh, I guess we'll find out whether or not they reinstate the dividends. You have Main Street Capital. Um, that one's a relatively big position as well. So I had a question on the last uh, video that I made. How is uh, the cost base is 32 and the current price is around 24, but I'm only down 13%. And that's because I have reinvested dividends here. So uh, granted, yes, I had to pay taxes on these reinvested dividends, but just for what my tax lots are, um, I can understand where you might be confused. Maybe I do things a little bit quirky, but I like to look at it on a, on a gross basis, maybe not necessarily a net basis. So uh, these are the shares that are going to continue to pay me. And so I kind of view them as free. I'm fine with paying the taxes now. That's not a problem to me. Um, you know, I'm not really utilizing this to, to keep a track of my taxes. I'll do that once a year. This is kind of a long-term investing sheet. So, um, but that's just me, maybe not for you. Uh, 3M, uh, currently 47 shares down almost 8% here. Uh, Altria Group um, have 139 shares down 10%. You have Pepsi, 54 shares down up 41%, sorry, uh, sitting at about a $2,000 gain. Phillips 66, 42 shares as well, sitting at about $380 loss. Uh, not a big problem there. Then you have Royal Dutch Shell sitting on 172 shares, only down 14%. So that's what I'm talking about. Cost basis is down almost to 40 so i would actually love to get this below 40 i would be ecstatic uh to have my shell shares below 40. Uh, maybe i'll buy another tranche of about 28 shares or so to get this to an even 200 and um, get myself to a decent tranche of uh of shell and i'm assuming two another 28 shares at 33 dollars 86 cents will get this definitely um, below $40 uh, per share. Um, AT&T have 274 shares at the moment, which is pretty crazy. Um, 
sitting on a gain, actually. Um, 2.1% gain. Buying it for the dividend, not necessarily for the capital gains, but if it's below 30 bucks, I'm going to buy it. Uh, cost basis is below 31 at the moment, so can't complain with that at all. U.S. Bank uh, started buying this in the 50s, and it has since dipped to the 30s and actually dipped into the 20s as well. Um, hoping to continue to lower this cost basis over time, and we'll do that, especially if it gets back below 30 bucks a share. Visa, this was a good buy. Wish I bought more. Um, bought uh, bought 20 shares at 136 bucks recently, uh, sitting on a 22% gain at the moment. Buying this one for the dividend growth. Uh, small dividend at the moment. Uh, it's less than 1%, uh, maybe closer to 1% now. 0.72%, 0. 0.88% um, if you're using the cost basis. Uh, but I anticipate it'll grow 20-30% a year for the next couple of years, so um, hoping that bad boy continues to grow uh, and eventually becomes a decent yield on cost, about 3-4% in the next couple of years, um, maybe 10 years down the road. Uh, you have Verizon, 110 shares, up 33% on that. Then you have Wells Fargo, down 33%, basically, sitting on 391 shares at the moment, which is pretty absurd. Um, cost basis down to 41 bucks. I think this bad boy rebounds. It's going to be a, a great day in heaven. Um, down of $5,000 on the position, but just going to continue to reinvest these dividends, man. Um, Wells Fargo, I think, is, is a good one for the long term. Do I wish that my shares in Wells Fargo and JP Morgan were switched? Of course. I wish I had 391 shares in JP Morgan at the moment rather than Wells Fargo. Uh, but I'm happy with 50 shares of J.P. Morgan. I'll continue to add. Um, and I have actually contemplated, do I sell a part of my Wells Fargo funds at the moment and invest those in J.P. Morgan? Because uh, I believe the long-term potential at the moment for J.P. Morgan is better. Um, I will continue to evaluate that as time goes on. Um, but yes, that is something I've considered. Uh, granted, I believe the value at the moment for Wells Fargo is slightly better. I think J.P. Morgan trades at a premium, but I think at the moment the balance sheet for J.P. Morgan is a little bit better and the management for J.P. Morgan is a little bit better than Wells Fargo at the moment. I think Wells Fargo is still not only dealing with the credit losses like everybody else, but they're also dealing with the litigation and the poor cultural aspect of the company at the moment. Uh, and I believe if you, if you were to give Warren Buffett a chance uh, to see which one he would invest in at the moment, he would probably invest in JP Morgan as well. Uh, so uh, I think that was relatively all I wanted to cover. I think this is a long one. You guys are probably still going to be upset in the comment section. That's fine. I uh, hope that somebody got some good value out of this. I recognize that these videos can kind of go on for a touch longer than you would want to. Uh, but yeah, that's the $416,000 portfolio. It's at least... 300 to $350,000 of it that we kind of just ran through relatively quickly right there. Uh, really hope you guys appreciate it. Um, like I said, we ran through the majority of it. Um, just looking at it here, individual brokerage accounts, 39%. Roth IRA is about 10%. Uh, we went through M1 Finance and Robinhood in here uh, already. And uh, if we actually go to the computer shares, we covered is about 4% as well. And we covered the personal savings. So, um, so yeah, it's looking pretty good, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's really all we'll we'll kind of touch on for this particular video, and uh, I will catch you guys on the next one. I'm gonna go to sleep now because it's Sunday night, and I will be releasing this tomorrow, and hopefully see you guys in a couple days for the April dividends as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, it's not gonna be as good as March, but uh, and won't be as good as June. But uh, we're really hoping to cross, cross that, excuse me, cross that $1,000 a month mark um, every single month. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, briefly just looking here, uh, let's scroll up here to 2020 dividends. You can see the $1,400 that we got last month, and we're currently at $750,886 for April and May expected income, respectively. And then starting in June and August, we're getting close to that $900 a month range. So really hoping that we can get to the point later this year where every single month we're expecting at least $1,000 to hit the accounts. Um, so we'll see. I know we'll definitely get there in 2021 if I continue to invest in companies that pay the first and second month of every quarter. Um, and I know for a fact the, the third month of every quarter is going to be fine because we're currently yielding about 1500 1600 every single one of those months. So 
I don't necessarily see any problems with those going forward. It's probably just uh, equaling out the first and second month of every quarter to the point where we're getting a thousand steady months um, here and out. And that'll be cool because that will be uh, that'll be cool. That'll be like a second person helping invest in the market. Uh, and that'll just continue to grow because we're currently at about 1250 on average every single month. Um, and so let's hope that it continues to stay like that. We don't see any further dividend cuts or suspensions in the future. Um, fingers crossed for that. And uh, yeah, that's really it. I'll leave you guys with that and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Let me know if there's any comments or anything and I'll address them uh, in the section down below. Oh, and actually what I wanted to also chime in is if you're interested in the sheet here that we're kind of looking at and um, everything like that. There's also a comment down in uh, our link in the description down below. I know nobody's probably listening to this at this point, but if you are and you really enjoyed the sheet, um, feel free to check that out. Um, and there's also some blog posts in there as well. So if you guys are more into reading and understanding where you can begin your investing journey, follow that website and uh, in the link uh, description, <laughs> link in the description, and uh, you'll get some pretty cool content. All right, guys, it's past midnight here. I'm going to sign off on this one, edit it tomorrow, and it'll be up for your guys' viewing pleasure. I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.